praise God. We give you praise. 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 You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for all that you're going to do this morning, Jesus. Thank you, God, for all that is going to be said this morning. We give you praise and glory and honor because you alone deserve the praise, God. You alone deserve the honor. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, I ask you to have your way this morning, God. Use my voice, God, for your glory, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Father, you take control, Father. Take control, Father. Father, we submit our minds, our thoughts, our desires to you, Lord God. Father God, that these ladies will be blessed by this word that you have for them, Lord God, this morning in the name of Jesus. And we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning for the first Women's Conference of Harmony Ministry 2019. All you beautiful women of Harmony Ministries and all our visitors that are here, I thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing your Saturday morning with us. We thank God for our pastor, Pastor Owen Olson. Put your hands together for our pastor. Our First Lady Alston, we thank you for being here with us this morning. And we appreciate you. We appreciate you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you spending the time with us. Today, um, my topic is Woman of God. Woman of God. And my subtitle is Beauty for Ashes. How many of us know that God will take the ashes and turn it into something beautiful? Amen. He will take the ashes and turn it into something beautiful. So I wanted to run to five women this morning and say to them that God is taking the broken pieces and putting them together for his glory. Go tell five women. God is taking the broken pieces and using it for his glory. Stand up and go and tell them. Stand up and go and tell them. Walk around and tell them. God is taking the broken pieces and using it for his glory. Go tell someone else. God is taking the broken pieces and using it for his glory. God is taking the broken pieces of your life. God is taking the broken pieces. Yes, that's what he does. He takes the broken pieces, the broken pieces, and puts it together and uses it for his glory. And that is what he's going to do with our lives today. That is what he wants to share with us this morning. The broken pieces that he puts together and mend it and make it into something beautiful. Because that is the kind of God that he is. Hallelujah, Jesus. We're going to start from Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 13. And it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vengeance to our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress, a beautiful crown for ashes, and all of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may call oaks of righteousness and be planted of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So God is taking all the broken areas of our lives, the 
the areas that causes us pain, the areas that causes us to cry sometimes, the areas that causes us that we feel struggle, and sometimes we feel disappointment and despair. God uses those areas in our lives to give him glory. He uses the broken pieces. And God did an exchange 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, he went to the cross and he did an exchange for us. He took the broken pieces of our lives and he gave us his joy. And he gave us his peace. And he gave us his wealth. And he gave us his health. So he take all that we had and made an exchange. And we today can enjoy the blessing of the Lord because of that exchange. And God has taken all these areas that, that are painful to us and exchanged them. He has blessed us. And many times we think of blessing as financial gain. But blessings can be peace. It can be joy. It can be that your descendants are blessed. It can be your children are blessed. Your generation is blessed. It can be health. It just can be just peace and rest in the Lord. And this is the exchange that God wants to give us today. He said, I'm going to take the ashes and make it into something beautiful. Amen. So despite the things that have kind of occurred in our lives, despite the hurt and the tragedy and the pain, God has a plan. God has a plan for your life. We serve an awesome God that loves us and cares about every aspect of our lives. He sees and knows everything that we go through. But guess what? We are going through them. We are not standing still. He said, when we go through the water, Jeremiah chapter 20, 43 and verse 2. When you pass through the water, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overtake you. When you walk through the fire, when you walk through the fire, not if you walk through the fire, because he knew that it will occur. He knew that we are going to have trials in our lives. He knew that we are going to have problems and situations, and he knew that he ha we have an enemy, the devil. But guess what? He is defeated. 2,000 years ago, he was defeated. So Jesus said, when you go through the water, we have confidence. Because we know that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He said, when you go through the water, I will be with you. When you go through the fire, you will not be burnt. You will not be burnt. You will not even smell of the smoke. Glory be to God. So we serve an awesome and a mighty God that loves us and cares for us and has given us everything that we need in life. He, in, in first, second Peter chapter 2 and verse 3, he said, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted us His precious and most great promises, so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature, have an escape from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. So God has already given us everything that we need. Amen. Everything that we need, he has already given us 2,000 years ago. And we just have to receive it. We just have to receive that gift of righteousness that he has given us. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 9, he said, Eyes have not seen, nor ear have heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And God loves you, and he loves me with an everlasting love. And that is why he died for us. He said, eyes have not seen. If you ever think of something that is very drastic for you to imagine, God can do above that. He can do above everything that we can ask, everything that we can think. He can do it. Amen? And it, when we are going through the fire, he, guess what? He said that he will never leave us. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. And this is very comforting to me because many times in my life when I've had many difficult situations in my life, I said, God, I know that you are with me. 
despite the fact of what is going on in my life, you are right there with me. You are right there taking me through this situation, taking me through this battle. And it's comforting to know that God is right there with us, holding our hands through the trials, holding our hands through the struggles, holding our hands through the pain, holding our hands through the disappointments. Amen? He's holding our hands and he's taking us through. And as women, and, and I'm sure there are a few men here, we have gone through many difficult situations in our lives. And all of us have a different story. Your situation may not be mine, and my situation may not be yours. But many of us have had broken situations very early in our lives. Some of us have had failed relationships. I had a, very, a failed relationship, my marriage very early in my life, at the age of 26 years old. I got married when I was 22 years old, and when I was 26, I was divorced with two children to take care of. So I had to know that God was with me. I had to know that God was near with me. I had to depend on him. I had to learn how to depend on him. I had to learn that he was my provider, and he was my keeper, and he was my friend, and he was my comforter, and he was my deliverer. And it's through those situations that God has made me to who I am today. He has taken the broken pieces of my life and used it for his glory. Yeah. The broken situations of my life and used it for his glory. The Bible says in, in Psalms chapter 30 and verse 5, it says that weeping, the sadness, the pain, the suffering, the struggles, the disappointments may last for a season weeping may endure for a night but joy joy comes in the morning joy comes in the morning so sometimes God uses this situation to process us and therefore sometimes we become broken and many times God sometimes don't use people until they are broken how many of us are broken in here this morning Broken so that we can be used by God. Broken so that he can have glory from our lives. As I said before, many of us have had different situations in our lives. Some have had their separation from their spouse through death. Or you might have a financial issue. Some people may have their children that they have brought up into the home, in a loving home, knowing the way of God, and they decided to go their own way. That, that brings pain to the women. That brings pain to the home. And many of us have experienced those situations in our lives. And many of us have become broken because of that. But I want to let you know that God is going to take the broken pieces and use it for his glory. The broken pieces of your life and use it for his glory. Sometimes we have health situations. Some people may suffer as women. Some people may suffer breast cancer or uterine cancer or cancers in their body. And God has taken them, all, taken them and made them whole again. He has used those broken pieces for his glory and God is going to continue to use those broken pieces in our lives and change those ashes into something beautiful and I want to let you know that those broken areas in our lives is only for a season Amen. the Bible says that weeping may endure for a night but joy 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 comes in the morning joy comes in the morning Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. So today we are going to study two women of God in the Bible, two of my favorite ladies in the Bible, two of my favorite sisters in the Bible, and they are Esther and Ruth. And we will see how God has used their lives and changed them from the, the ashes in their lives and make it into something beautiful. You cannot do anything with ashes. It's dirty. It's just to be blown away in the wind. But God can take those broken areas, the broken areas in their lives, and make it into something beautiful. Amen? Amen. So first we're going to start off with Esther. And the book of Esther shows first that God is in control. No matter what is going on in our lives, we have to know that God is in control. That he is faithful. He's omnipresent, he's omniscient, he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, and he's in control. And he will deliver us, 
He will deliver us from the situations and the pain and the struggles that we go through. It shows the unity of a human purpose with God's purpose. The human purpose with God's purpose. And how many of us know that we have to unite our purpose with God's purpose so that his will can be done in our lives? We cannot be doing our own thing. We cannot be disobedient and, and going our own way and not attending to his word and expect God to fulfill his plan in our lives. Yeah. Amen? So we see here that in Esther, and we're going to turn to Esther. And we know the story of Esther um, that King Ahasuerus, he had a big feast and they had this feast for seven days and he had told Queen Vashti to come and parade in front of them and Queen Vashti had refused. How many of us know that things don't happen for coincidence? Amen? It didn't happen for coincidence. And so Queen Vashti was told that she would no longer be queen. And God had a plan for Esther. We will start from Esther chapter 2 and verse 7. So God decided that Esther is going to be queen instead of Queen Vashti. And it says, And Mordecai had brought up Hadasha, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father or mother. She was an orphan. She was an orphan. And just think of the pain that she may have had to suffer from being an orphan. The pain and the suffering and the loneliness, not having her mother or her father next to her. But God... She had neither mother or father. The young woman was beautiful and lovely. Was lovely and beautiful. So although that she did not have a parent, God had made her something beautiful. He had made her something lovely. So I want to let you know today that sometimes we may be looking at different women and say, well, you know what? They got, some, they got that and I don't have it. God has given each one of us something beautiful. Your beautiful may not be my beautiful. My trial may not be your trial. But he has given each one of us something special. He said that our price is far above rubies. Amen? Amen? So he had, she was an orphan, but he had given her something that was beautiful. And Mordecai had to take care of her. So just imagine this young girl being brought up by a man. She had lost her parents. She didn't even have another woman to take care of her. She was being brought up by a man. A man that was her uncle. So right there we can see that she had pain. She probably had despair. She probably had loneliness. Times when she had to struggle. And we're going to, we're going to jump to verse 9. And it says, Now the young woman pleased him. And she obtained his favor. So she had to go before the king and she obtained favor. So God is going to make us have favorable situations in our lives, despite the things that we are going through. So she readily gave beauty preparation to her, her beside her allowance. Then seven choice maid servants were provided for her from the king's palace and he moved her and her maid servants to the best place in the house of the woman. So just imagine that Esther was an orphan, an orphan maybe in a poor, desperate situation. And here she was, had to suddenly be moved in a place where she was a queen. Can you imagine the stress of knowing that I was just an orphan, and here I am, moved into this position of being a queen. And Esther had not revealed her, her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. So again, here we see that Esther had to hide her identity. She had to hide who she was. She was not only an orphan, 
but she had to hide who she was. And we're going to turn to verse 15. Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihal, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter, to go to the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king, eunuch, the custodian of the woman, advised. So Esther was obedient. She followed instructions. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all those who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus to his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the Mount of Tibeth, in the 70th of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor. So God is going to cause us to receive grace and favor in situations in our lives. He will shift things around, move people around. Sometimes you get a position in a job and you don't even know how you got it. That is favor from God. Amen. Somebody maybe, maybe, got, maybe got sick, you didn't want them to get sick, or they may have to resign or something, and God just shifted you in that position. He showed you favor in that position, and he showed Esther favor. So, 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgin. So she set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So here we have an orphan girl, and suddenly she became the queen. Verse 20, now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the commandments of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. So we see here that that, that Esther was trained by Mordecai and she was obedient to him. She followed his instructions. She followed what he told her to do. And as women of God, we have to follow God's instructions. His word has given us certain instructions in our lives and we have to incline our ear to his instructions and follow his instructions. Then we're going to jump to verse 3. We're going to jump around. I'm not going to read everything because for time's sake. And after these things, King Ahasuerus, chapter 3, promoted Haman, the son of Hamadiah, the, Ga the Gadadite, and advised him and set his seat above all the prince who were with him. So actually, Haman was an enemy of Esther and Mordecai. And we are going to have enemies in our lives. The devil is our enemy. But the Bible says that no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Amen. No weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Amen. So we see that Haman had P in verse 5, in chapter 3 and verse 5. And when Haman saw Mordecai, so Haman wanted Mordecai to bow, to, to bow down to him. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage to him, Mordecai was filled with wrath. Yeah. And the enemy is filled with wrath sometimes in our lives because he knows that our heart is to serve God. Right. He knows the plan that God has for us. And so he is mad with mankind. He would never be able to spend time with Jesus in glory. And he knows that we, that is our home, that we can spend time with Jesus in glory. We can spend eternity with Jesus in glory. So he is mad. He, he is upset. He is our enemy. And we have to know that he is our enemy. And resist him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Chapter um, verse 6. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai instead. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews. So his plan was to destroy all the Jews, and Esther and Mordecai was a Jew. Verse 13, and the letters were sent by courier to all the king provinces to destroy and to kill and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and young women, in one place on the 13th date of the 12th month, which is the month of Agai, and, the plund and plundered their possession. So God has a plan for your life, and the enemy has a plan for your life. So you see here that the enemy had a plot. He was plotting against all the Jews. He was plotting against Esther and Mordecai. But guess what? We are winners through Christ Jesus. 
We are winners through Christ Jesus. No weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Amen. And so we turn to chapter 4. And when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sash clothes, sash cloth and ashes, and went into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud voice and cried bitter. He went as far as the front gate, for no one might enter the gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king command and decree arrived, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping. Ah, oh, Robosa. So you see there that they had pain. Pain and suffering. Weeping and fasting. And this is what sometimes as women and men that are, that are in our midst, we have to get back to prayer and fasting. We have to get back to prayer and fasting and put it as a priority in our lives. Because prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. We have to bring the situation in our lives to God. So Esther's made, chapter, verse 4, so Esther made and the eunuch came and told her, and the queen told her, and the queen was very deeply distressed. Again, she was in pain. She was distressed. She suffered agony to know that there was an enemy that was plotting against them. And Esther decided she would have a fast. In, in chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, Go gather all the Jews who are sent in Shunem and fast for me. Neither eat or drink for three days, night and day. My maid and I will go likewise, and I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So here we can see that Esther was in desperation. She was desperate. She said, I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray. And if I perish, I perish. She had reached a point in her life where she knew that it was only God that can help her. Oh, Rabasa, that it's only God that can help her. It's only God that can change the situation in our life. It's only God that can fix it. And many times we reach an area in our life that we know that we have to put our hands up and we say that we have done it enough. We have tried it on our own. We have tried this and we have tried that. But we have to know that it's God is the one that can fix it. God is the one that can put the pieces together. God is the one that can put the broken pieces together. She said, if I perish, I perish. Oh, Rabbi Sah. If I perish, I perish. So she was desperate. She was desperate for God. She was yearning for God. How many of us yearning for God? Yearning for his presence. Yearning for his anointing. Yearning for his peace. Yearning for his joy. Are you desperate? Are you desperate for him? She said, if I perish, let me perish. I'm going to stand up for Jesus. I'm going to do what he say do. Whether it hurts sometimes, whether it's painful sometimes, whether the enemy come against me, I know that I'm going to win. Despite the pain, we know that we're going to win. So God had a plan for her as well. Chapter 5 and verse 3. And the king said to her, what do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. So Esther answered, If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. So Esther had a plan. I'm sure that she must have been in the presence of God for God to give her the wisdom that she needs. And this is what God has to do with us sometimes. We have to get in his face. We're in the situation we don't know where to turn and what to do. We have to seek his face and get a wisdom from him as to how we can make the decisions in our lives. Amen? We have to seek his face. And so she had a plan. She said that she's going to have a banquet. Chapter, um, chapter 5, verse 8. And if 
I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I have prepared for them tomorrow, and I will do as the king has said. Praise the Lord. So Haman had a plan to kill all the Jews. And chapter, uh, verse 10, it says, Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and called his friends and his wife, Zeres. Then Haman told them of his great riches and the multitude of his children, everything which the king had promoted him and how he advanced above the officials and the servants of the king. So sometimes the enemy parade all these things in front of our face and shows us what he is doing in our lives. But how many of us know that we have to keep our eyes focused on Jesus? Yeah. Despite the fact of what God, the enemy places in front of you, places the painful situations, pays, places the struggles, the loneliness. He, we have to keep our our eyes faced on Jesus. Amen. Moreover, Mordecai said, beside Queen Esther invited no one else. So he, he was boastful, but me to come to the king, to the banquet that she has prepared. And tomorrow I am again invited by her along with the king. So here he is boasting, you know, that they didn't invite anybody else but me. I'm, I, I'm, I'm special. <laughs> then his wife, Zestra, and all the friends said to him, let's a gallop be made, 50 cubits high, and in the morning suggested the king that Mordecai be hung on it. So here the enemy was planning to hang Mordecai. But guess what? That is not how the story ends. Amen? That is not how the story ends. So Queen Esther, as I said, seek God. She fasted and prayed. And ask God for the wisdom of how she has to steer this situation. And so she decided to have a banquet. And chapter 7. And it says, so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of the wine, the king again said to Esther, what is your petition? Queen Esther, it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my wife, my life be given to me as a petition and my people for my request. So we see Esther, although that she was an orphan, she was in distress, she was painful, yet she wasn't seeking her own. She was seeking actually for the people that are around her. She was seeking for her Jews. She was seeking for the Jews for the benefit of the Jews. And sometimes when we have situations in our lives, we have to take the focus off of ourselves and put it onto somebody else, right? We cannot be selfish. We cannot be thinking of our own. The, the enemy wants us to keep our eyes on all the negative situation in our lives, but we have to transfer that and help someone else. Think of someone else. Go out and do something for someone, and you will see that situation maybe dissipate from your mind. So here we see Esther, although that she was in this situation, she was thinking of her people. She was not selfish. She wasn't thinking of her own gain. And she told them that they wanted to sell her people and to destroy all her people. And verse 6 it says, and Esther said, that the adversary, the enemy, is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king. So he realized now that he was in a situation where he was pointed out that they knew his plot. And we see here in, in verse, uh, let's turn to chapter 8. Let's turn to, sorry, chapter 6 and verse 7. Now Hababan, one of the eunuchs, said, to the king, look, the gallows, 50 cubit high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good of the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. So the same plot that he had for Esther and Mordecai, he ended up hanging himself Amen. on the plot. Amen. So God is going to reverse the curse in our lives. He is going to take the ashes and make it into something beautiful. 
We know that we are winners because of Jesus. And so we, we knew, know the end of the, the story that Esther was able to save her people. In verse um, 9 and verse 25, and Esther was able to send letters out. And when Esther came before the king, he commanded that letters that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should be returned on his own head. The plot that he had for his enemy was returned to his own head. That God is able to turn the situation in our lives around and make it for his glory. He's able to take the broken pieces and put them back together so that he can have glory from our lives. He's able to take the ashes and make it into something beautiful. So here we see that he had commanded that Haman be hanged on the same plot that he had for Esther and Mordecai. And Esther, from being an orphan, became the queen. And Mordecai, in chapter 10 and verse 3, it says, For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and well received in the multitude of his brethren, seeking good to all his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. So here we see victory. Victory in Jesus. We have victory in Jesus. That God is able to turn the situations in our lives around for his glory and for his honor. Amen? Amen. God is able to turn the situation around. He said in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for your welfare and not for evil. Plans to give you a future and hope. He knows the plans that he has for us. He knows the plan that we have for us. Even before we were born, he said in Psalms chapter 139, he said, for I formed you in the inner parts. I knitted you in my mother's womb and praised you for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows well in you. My frame was hidden from you and I made it in secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, I saw you and formed you and made you into a substance. In the book were written, every one of them, the days were formed for me, and yet there was none. So God knew you before you were created. He knew you before you became a substance. And he knew that he has a good plan for you. So despite what the enemy is doing in your life, know that God has an awesome plan for your life. And he's going to take the ashes and to make it into something beautiful. Amen? And the other sister that we are going to look at this morning is Ruth. Amen? So God has placed these situations in our Bible to encourage us, to uplift us, so that when we go through situations in our life, we can look at our sister Esther, who God has taken from being an orphan and made her into a queen who God gave wisdom and knowledge in a situation when she didn't know what to do. She said, if I perish, let me perish. She turned to God when the situation was rough. She turned to prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting bring us closer to God. It let us know the mind of God. It let us know the plan of God. Amen? So let's take a look at our sister Ruth. Praise the Lord. So some lessons that we can learn from Esther before I go on to Ruth is that through these lessons that we can see that God can turn pain into blessings. And prayer, as I said, is important. And it can turn situation around. And God will encourage us to accomplish his will and his purpose. But obedience is vital. Obedience is vital. We see that Esther was obedient. She was obedient to all that Mordecai had told her to do. And God gave her grace and favor in great pain. And God is faithful, fighting, and giving us the strength for our battles. She was also determined. She wasn't giving up. She said, if I perish, let me perish. She also put her people before herself. She wasn't selfish, and she never became discouraged. You know, this is one of the weapons that the enemy uses on us. He makes us become discouraged. He may not be able to, to let you fornicate or let you lie or let you steal, but sometimes he can make you feel discouraged. 
when we keep our eyes on the situation. But let, let me tell you today that we have to shift our eyes from the struggles and from the pain and from the suffering and put it on Jesus. Because he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. So the lesson of Ruth, and we know the story of Ruth. And Ruth had faced many difficult situations as our sister Esther. She had faced times of sorrows and insufficiency, not enough food. She was in the field having to work, lost of loved ones. Yet she remained loyal and hardworking. She was obedient. She prophesied on herself when things became difficult. And she trusted God through every situation in our, her life. And even in sorrow and calamity, God is able to turn the situations around and make it into a blessing. Amen? Amen. So let's look at our sister Ruth. Praise the Lord. God has placed these women in the Bible for our encouragement. So let's start with chapter 1, and it says, Now it came to pass in the day of the judges, when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land. So here we see there is lack. Lack of resources. In the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judea, went to dwell in the country of Mobai, and he and his wife and his sons. And the name of the man was Amalek, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons was Malon and Chalon, Ephorites of the Bethlehem, Judea. And they went to the country of Moab, and they remained there. Then Amalek, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with two sons. So here again we see that Naomi had to suffer pain from the separation of her husband through debt. Now these two wives of the woman of Moab, the name of one was Oprah, and the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there for about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilean also died. So here we have Naomi. Her husband died. And she had two sons. And her two sons died. And I can imagine how Naomi must have felt. The pain, the despair, the loneliness that she had to feel from the death and the separation of her loved ones. Then both Malian, sorry, and verse 6 it says, And they arose and with her daughter-in-law that she might return to the country of Moab. And she heard in the country, for she heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. So we see here that they were experiencing lack and they were looking for something that was better. Amen? We're going to turn to verse 15. I'm going to jump around again because of time. And in chapter 1 and verse 15, and it says, and um, Naomi says, and she said, look for your sister alone has gone. She had, Naomi was unselfish. She had told her daughter-in-law, because your husband is dead, probably go and find someone else because she thought that they, they, they were young ladies. And she had advised them to probably remarry. And she said in verse 15, look for your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from you, following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And so we see Ruth was faithful to your Naomi. Amen. She must have seen something in Naomi that she wanted. She must have seen something in Naomi life that was an example to her. And I want to encourage us as women that some and men that are in the midst of us, that somebody is looking at our lives. Somebody is looking at our lives and sometimes they can get encouragement from our lives. Amen? So I'm sure that Ruth must have seen something in Naomi that she thought that was good. Because she said, wherever you go, I will go. That your people will be my people. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. 
And so in verse 19 it says, And now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they came to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, It is Naomi. So here they were. They had to move from where they were before and move to another place. Not coincidence. There is no coincidence with God. There is no coincidence with God. So God had directed them to move to Bethlehem. And we will see that eventually that in Bethlehem, that is where David was born and end up being in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So being from an orphan, sorry, from being uh, um, in, in a famine, in a situation where her husband had died, here we see that she decided to go with her mother-in-law to Bethlehem. I'm, I'm sure that they were directed by God. And this is why I, I keep encouraging us that we have to seek the face of God. When we are in situations where we don't know what to do, we have to seek God's face for his direction. Because he is no coincidence. He is going to guide us in the right path that we need to go. But we have to ask him. In verse 2 it says, And there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Emelech, and his name was Boaz. But Ru so Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of the grain after him, in whose sight I may find favor. So Naomi, sorry, Ruth, had to prophesy on herself. She said, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. So she didn't know how the situation was going to happen, but yet still she was prophesying. She was saying, I might find favor with this man. And then she left and went into the field after the reapers, and as it happened to come to the part of the field, belonging to Moab. It happened. It wasn't coincidence. Again, God is directing our lives in the place that he wants us to be, ordering our steps according to his will. And as she, as she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Moab, who was at the family of Emelech, now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reaper, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. Then Moaz, Boaz said to the servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So therefore God caused her to be noticed. Maybe sweaty in the field. Right? Sweaty working in the field. And God caused her to be noticed. So ladies, if God has a plan for you, he will fulfill it no matter what. She was dirty. She wasn't dressed up with her lipstick on. <laughs> she was sweaty and dirty working in the field, and Boaz noticed her. So that's God. So the servant who was in charge of the reaper answered and said, It is the young Moabite who came back from the Yomi, from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and continued from morning until now, though she rested a while in the house. So we see again that Ruth wasn't lazy. She worked from morning until night. Sweaty and dirty. And yet still she was noticed because God had a plan for her life. In verse 9 it says, Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded a young man not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessel and drink from the young men that have drawn. So here we see that God is a provider. That God is providing for her. He knew that she was in need and he has made provision for her. He was also protecting her. He, he said, do not let the young man touch her. So God is going to protect us. He's going to provide for us. He's going to keep us. He's going to have fa we're going to find favor. So in verse 10 it says, And she fell on her face, bowed to the ground, and said, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I have a foreigner? So another thing that um, Ruth was, she was a foreigner. She had lost her husband. She was a foreigner. She was hungry. She was thirsty. 
And yet we see God making all these provisions for her. And Boaz answered and said, it has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law. As I said, somebody is looking at your life. Since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given by the Lord of Israel under whose wing you have come to take refuge. So the Lord is going to repay you just like how he repaid Ruth. It says in verse 12, the Lord repay your work and give you a full reward be given to you by the Lord of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly of your maidservant. Do I'm not one like you. So as I said, she was a foreigner. She wasn't belonging to their clan. Now Boaz said to her at the mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. Again, we see God providing. He's our great Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider in the time of famine, in the time of pain, in the time of lack. He is our provider. So she sat beside the reaper and he parched, passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied. Glory be to God. God was able to satisfy her. And God and she ate and was satisfied and she also had some remaining back. So God is not only going to supply our needs, but he's going to give us abundance that we have remaining. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded that the young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. So here we see that God is just providing for her, that God is making a way. And let her grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. So God was making it fall purposely so that she will be able to have food. And leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. Again, providing for her, comforting her, satisfying her, making sure that her needs were met. In verse 17 it says, And so she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city of her mother-in-law, and saw that she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. So God is going to make us in such a way that he's going to satisfy our needs and we're going to have enough to give to somebody else. Amen? And we're not going to all keep it to ourselves and say all is mine. So she had enough that she was able to be satisfied and she was able to share with her mother-in-law. So here we see that she was unselfish. Here we see a young woman that could have gone like a, her other sister-in-law, Oprah, and got remarried, but she stick to this old woman who was in a painful situation. Yeah. And we will see how God removed the ashes and make it into something beautiful. Yeah. And her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be one of you who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man named who I worked with is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her, blessed be of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and to the dead. So God is a faithful God. Amen. He is faithful. And Naomi said to her, this man is a relative of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth and the Moabites said, he also said to me, you shall stay close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. So you, we see here that God, although that Ruth was in a painful situation, that God was providing for her. God was protecting her. That God was meeting all her needs. He was faithful. And he is going to be faithful for, to us in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the pain. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will never desert us. He's right there with us. Amen? Amen. Another thing that we notice about Ruth is also, just like Esther, she was obedient. Whatever Naomi told her to do, she did it. Amen. In verse, chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, he, She said, therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So Ruth did exactly what her mother-in-law had told her to do. 
And many of us, sometimes we think of our mother-in-law, how many of us will follow exactly what our mother-in-law tell us to do? But God is just showing us an example that no matter who he's coming from, the word of God remains standard. Whatever that he says to do, we have to do it. Amen? Amen. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in and cover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you will do. And all, and she said to her, all that you say to me to do, I will do. All that you say to me to do, that I will do. And that is what we have to say to God. All what you say to me to do, that I will do. No matter what is happening, no matter the disappointment, no matter the pain, Amen. all what you say to me to do, I will do. Amen. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all her mother-in-law instructed her. She did everything as she was told to do. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was che cheerful, he went down to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly and covered his feet and lay down. Now, I'm not encouraging any of you ladies to do that, but this is what, <laughs> this is what Ruth did. Amen? And, she's, and in verse 9, and he says, And who are you? And she said, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wings so that you for you are a close relative. And in verse 11, and it says, he said, and now my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all your requests. And for all the people of your town know that you are a virtuous woman. So God, again, made her have favor in the eyes of Boaz. And Boaz was a man of integrity. She wasn't God didn't set up, up with somebody that didn't have integrity, that didn't love the Lord, that didn't have a plan for her. So as young women and our teenagers in our midst and young women and single women, we have to know that God have a plan for us. We, you don't have to be desperate. Boaz find Ruth. Ruth didn't find Boaz. Amen? And Boaz was a man of integrity. He wasn't somebody standing in the corner. He, he, he was a rich man. And not that necessarily that I'm saying that you have to look for somebody rich. But God is going to give you the best. He is going to give you the best. The best are his for the children of God. And... Uh, Verse um, 15, and it says, and she says, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephah of barley and laid it out for her and went into the city. Again, we see that this man that God has provided for, for Ruth was kind. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of knowledge. He was wealthy. These are the, 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 the things that God is going to bless us. When he is blessing us, he blesses us with something that is good. Amen? Amen. And in verse 17, it says, Then she said, These six ephah of barley he gave for, for me, gave me, for he said, Do not, empty, do not go empty hand to your mother-in-law. Again, God is providing for her. God has showed her favor. And then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter. And of course, Boaz was a man, as I said before, of integrity. He was a man of standard. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. In verse 4 and verse 9, and it says, And Boaz said to the elders of all the people, You are my witness. So he had a witness. He didn't do things sneaky and backwards. He went to the elders and did according to the process that he was supposed to do. And he said, You are my witness this day. I have brought you all that the Amalek that was at Amalek and all the Chileans and Malians from the hands of Naomi. So he went through the standard process that was needed so that he can have root. And we know the story, the how it ended in verse 4 and verse 15, that Ruth and Boaz ended up being married. They had a son. And in verse 15, and it says... In, sorry, in verse 14, then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he 
be to you a restorer of life. So God is our restorer and a nourisher of your old age. He will nourish us and replenish us. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor woman gave him a name saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they call his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Amen. So here God took Ruth from being in a famine, her husband had died. He took her all through, he provided for her. He kept her. He provided a husband for her with integrity, with standard. He satisfied her. And she moved to Bethlehem, not by coincidence. She was directed to Bethlehem by the hands of the Lord. And God is directing your life right now into his perfect will. Despite the broken pieces, despite the broken circumstances in your life, he's directing it. And she ended being the grandmother of David in the lineage of Jesus. So God had a plan, just like he has a plan for you. So despite of what is going on, Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus because he has a plan. He said, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. We serve a loving God that we see that in root, that he turned despair and loneliness into a life of hope and joy and prosperity. He turned the ashes into a crown of beauty Amen. so that he will get the glory. Amen. Don't underestimate the plans that God has for your life. Amen. Don't underestimate the struggles that you face in your life and the situations Amen. that you face. That God is able to take all these broken pieces and make it into something beautiful. Amen. He's able to make it into something beautiful. He said that he will turn the situation for his glory. Amen? Amen. You are special. We just have to remain humble. Yes. We have to remain obedient. Right. We have to remain consistent. Right. Amen? Amen? Full of integrity and commitment. Yes. And God is going to do the rest. Amen. So we give honor to God that he can do it. Yes. He can do it. That no weapon that is formed against us will prosper. Yes. No weapon. No matter what the enemy plan is going to fall back on him. Amen? Amen? So Ruth was faithful, she was obedient, she prophesied on herself. Let's quickly turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. You know, sometimes we have to prophesy on ourselves. Amen. Prophesy when the situation don't, go, don't look good. Chapter 37 and verse 1, and it says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause bread to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinew on you and flesh upon you and cover your flesh and breathe breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and I prophesied there was a noise. And suddenly a rattling and the bones came together. Bones to bones. Indeed, as I looked, the sinew and the flesh came upon them. And the skin covered them over. And there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, O son of man. And say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come out from the four winds, O breath. And breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And bread came out of them and they live. And they stood upon the feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, 
These bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. So what did God say to do? Prophesy. Prophesy over the situations in our lives. When we see that it's not going well, prophesy over it. Say what God will say over it. I am the head and not the tail. Above and not beneath. I'm healthy. I'm wealthy. I'm rich. I'm faithful. I'm just. I'm right. Prophesy over yourself. And God is going to change the situations in our lives. It's nothing that is impossible with God. Nothing that he can do. The Bible said with man is impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. And God is going to change the situations in your life. God is going to turn it around and make it into something beautiful. God is going to turn it around and make it into something beautiful. God is going to turn it around and make it into something beautiful. It into something beautiful. Come on ladies, let us come to the front. We're going to pray for each other this morning. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God prophesy on each other. In the name of Jesus. Prophesy on each other. In the name of Jesus. Prophesy on each other. Come on. Come on. Let's pray. Pray for each other. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Everybody come to the front. Hold a woman hand next to you. Prophesy over her life.